I have the wonderful honor of being with really an amazing human being, Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome, Dr. David Perlmutter. Mark, I am delighted to be here. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Let me, let me say a few words about you and what you've been up to to get viewers and listeners caught up. So Dr. Perlmutter is a board-certified neurologist and fellow of the American College of Nutrition. He's the author of the number one New York Times bestselling book, Grain Brain, The Surprising Truth About Wheat, Carbs, and Sugar, Your Brain's Silent Killers. This book has appeared for more than 33 consecutive weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Dr. Perlmutter is a frequent lecturer at symposia sponsored by such medical institutions as Columbia University, University of Arizona, Scripps Institute, NYU, and Harvard. He's contributed extensively to the world medical literature and is the author of seven books, editor-in-chief of the peer-reviewed medical journal Brain and Gut, Dr. Perlmutter has been on numerous national broadcast programs. In addition, he's the recipient of the Linus Pauling Award, Humanitarian of the Year Award from the American College of Nutrition, lots of others. He also serves on the medical advisory board for uh, Dr. Oz Show, and his newest book is The Brain Maker. I like that title. Um, David, why don't we start from the big picture? You've said that many of our most feared brain conditions are preventable. Uh, can you explain? I can. And, you know, we live in a society where it's um, pretty much, uh, at least as it relates to brain disorders, a situation of diagnose and adios, meaning, <laughs> you know, we make the na uh, diagnosis, name the disease, and then you're pretty much on your own. And, you know, as it relates to Alzheimer's disease affecting 5.6 million Americans, costing us about $200 billion a year, twice what we're spending on treating heart patients. Uh, there is no treatment, as you and I have this conversation, Mark, right at this moment. That disease has no treatment and certainly no cure. And yet we now fully understand that wonderfully uh, researched publications have demonstrated that to a very significant degree, Alzheimer's, for example, is a preventable disorder and a reversible disorder. Dr. Dale Bredesen at UCLA has recently published uh, his uh, results of uh, actually demonstrating reversal of the symptoms of Alzheimer's, people regaining cognitive function by making some uh, very significant uh, lifestyle changes, which really center upon uh, actually working on uh, the causes of inflammation in human physiology. We now recognize that the cornerstone in neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, autism, uh, even Parkinson's, and to some degree ADHD, that inflammation really acts as a pivotal mechanistic player related to all of those conditions. And, you know, your viewers of this podcast may be surprised because, you know, they may think of inflammation as, as getting bitten by a mosquito and your arm gets inflamed. Mm -hmm. But inflammation is a cornerstone mechanism in heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and now we know uh, in brain degenerative disorders as well. And what is so uh, powerful is the uh, notion that we now understand that at least with respect to these systemic issues like I've mentioned, that the gut and the bacteria contained within the gut play a pivotal role in determining how much inflammation is in your body. So we therefore turn to the gut uh, as an opportunity to give us tools uh, to really for the first time uh, have an opportunity to really uh, make changes and reducing inflammation. And I think it is dramatically blowing the doors wide open in terms of our ability to now, for the first time in history, have a meaningful impact, not only in treating these devastating conditions, but actually in their prevention. Well, let me ask you this question. When did you as a neurologist first start to realize that on so many levels, ground zero for neurology is the gut? Like, when did that occur to you? And <laughs> how has that been rolling out for you? I, I'm gonna tell you, Mark, um, I, I'm not going to tell you there was an epiphany moment that I can mm -hmm. tell you that on that specific date, it hit me like a thunderbolt, but it didn't. Um, I think I've always, uh, initially in my career as being trained as a neurologist, uh, felt very shorthanded 
coming to the job with very few tools in the toolbox that basically I was instructed during my residency in terms of treating symptoms with uh, drug remedies and very poorly at that that we treat uh, headaches by giving headache pills and uh, etc much as you might treat high blood pressure by giving blood pressure medications when uh, when if you pay attention to certain lifestyle issues that lead to these problems that are causal that becomes the powerful leverage point so I came to this understanding with the desire to open up the toolbox and gain more tools and more and more it became clear that the the notion of the brain being over here and the gut being over here was uh, really not founded ever in the history of medicine mm -hmm. that this call it holistic if you will but a unified approach to uh, dealing with human health and illness is really the most comprehensive approach that we've ever had and it's always been this way the reductionist mentality uh, purported by you know brought into the field of, of medicine and health really from the early work of, of Descartes looking at the body as basically a machine has not served us well in any way when we look upon the brain as being completely dissociated from the gut it isolates the powerful approaches that we could take uh, because it's very narrow-minded, it's very myopic. Gastroenterologists are interested in the gut and don't pay any attention to the brain. Neurologists think that really there's nothing below the foramen magnum that they're interested in and as such they are cutting themselves off from a very uh, rich potential in terms of leverage points to really have a powerfully meaningful impact in some of our most devastating conditions. Um, you know, for example, we now fully recognize that there is a unique fingerprint of the gut bacteria that defines autism, for example. That when you look at the gut microbes and you do an analysis of those bacteria that live within the gut, you find that the autistic gut, the autistic stool specimens that you would look at have a, a unique signature and when you look at those bacteria that are found characteristically in the autistic patient what you find is for example an overgrowth of one species or one type of organism called clostridia now we're now seeing a dramatic increase in clostridia infections in humans causing a disease called clostridium difficile 30 to 40,000 Americans are hospitalized each year with what is called C. diff. And interestingly enough, it's now been demonstrated that the most powerful approach to treating C. diff has been what's called a fecal transplantation, meaning taking fecal material from a healthy person and transplanting that into the C. diff patient to reestablish balance. That's about 92 to 96 percent effective in treating C. diff now being done in more than 150 hospitals here in America. Much less, much less effective is the standard treatment that has been used for a long time, antibiotics, which is about 28 percent effective. Think about that. By restoring, by restoring balance to the gut, that's become the most powerful approach to treating this imbalance, which leads to overgrowth of C. diff. Now. I mentioned a moment ago that we're also seeing overgrowth of clostridial species, a different type of clostridia called Clostridia histolyticum, in the autistic patient. So the idea is uh, what can we do uh, as a possible treatment in autism to reestablish gut health and hope that we get some benefit from a neurological perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's heartening to see in fact, in BrainMaker, I actually report of a case of uh, a child, a 10-year-old child with autism, autism uh, whose mother uh, was able to arrange for him to undergo fecal transplantation, and he regained almost perfect fluency of speech, became almost completely uh, socially interactive, and um, she has agreed to allow me to place a video of him uh, on our website, which which we will do uh, when BrainMaker is published, uh, probably uh, when, I don't know when this is going to air, but probably by that time. Um, and we now recognize that the University of Arizona is recruiting autistic patients for fecal transplant as a treatment for that disease by reestablishing gut health. So 
you know, over the years, and as you and I have been having these conversations, we've talked about things like gluten and high carbohydrate diets and their damaging effects upon uh, the brain through the mechanism of inflammation. Uh, now we've taken it to another level. We've taken it to a level where it's not just the foods that we eat, but how those foods that we consume influence the balance of gut bacteria and how that then influences brain health function and disease. You know, when you, when you recognize that, for example, 95% of the, of the neurotransmitter serotonin is manufactured in the gut. Mm -hmm. And there's a relationship between serotonin and something like depression. We begin to understand that the balance of gut bacteria has a role to play in depression. That the balance of gut bacteria, because it has a role to play in inflammation, influences our risk for any number of brain degenerative conditions as well as things like obesity, diabetes, and even cancer. And that, again, this is an intervention. This is a leverage point then for us uh, that opens up the door to vast possibilities well beyond the brain. And certainly, you know, I'm not saying that the only uh, available opportunity to reprogram the gut comes from a fecal transplantation. But looking at foods that are probiotic in and of themselves, like fermented foods, like kombucha and kimchi uh, and uh, yogurt and kefir, for example, and prebiotic foods, foods that contain things like inulin mm -hmm. that will enhance the growth of good bacteria, uh, foods like jicama or Mexican yam, um, dandelion greens, chicory root, garlic, onions. These, these are foods that tend to enhance the growth of good bacteria. And then again, uh, from a preventive perspective, recognizing that we in America are dramatically overusing antibiotics, and that is having a devastating effect upon the balance and the diversity of organisms, of bacterial organisms that live within the gut. You know, Mark, you have in your body 10 times more bacteria than you have Mark cells. So you are you know, 90% bacteria and only 10% you. Mm -hmm. Your body is the vessel, the repository for this organ that we now call the human microbiome. 99% of the DNA in your body is bacterial. It's not those, you know, your DNA, your 22,000 uh, uh, genes that uh, everyone is so excited about uh, that was, were sequenced. I mean, if you think that's a lot of genes, the rice plant, has twice as much DNA as you do. So it's not as if, you know, the number of genes that we, that we carry uh, is somehow uh, related to our complexity. Mm -hmm. We have offloaded uh, our genetics. Uh, we don't, you know, like you don't carry around every picture that you own on your iPhone. You carry around some, but you know you, you have access to them because they're downloaded to the cloud. You can always re refer back to the cloud for more information. In much the same way, we refer to the cloud of, of genetic information that is stored within the, the genome of the bacteria that live within us, the microbiome. So this is a, this is a revolutionary time in, in human uh, understanding what really is underlying human health and illness. And of course, from my perspective, finally some very powerful information that's giving us great tools to really, uh, in a very powerful way, treat brain disorders. You know, I'm I'm just as you're speaking, I'm I'm taken by this, you know, in part this amazing metaphor that we're home for trillions of these bacteria that are essential for us. Part of me wants to start charging rent. You know, this could be another income stream here. Oh, they're paying. Uh, they're, paying <laughs> they're giving you your health and your life. Uh, that's what they're paying for the. The, the warm, moist environment and the foods that you are provided to these organisms. Without them, uh, you'd have no immune function. Mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't be able to respond to your environment. You know, you have to understand that the lining of your gut, if you uh, opened it up, is the size of a tennis court. And that is the relationship that you have with your external environment. And that everything that goes on within your gut profoundly influences moment to moment uh, your health in, in every way, your absorption of nutrients. Uh, your levels of, of, of immune function, your levels of inflammation, the production of various vitamins, and even the production of the neurotransmitters. So 
Uh, and it's all based upon the array of bacteria that live within us. Now, we in Western cultures, uh, when you look at the array of gut bacteria, we find that our level of diversity is dramatically reduced in comparison to cultures that have less obsession with um, hygiene. Mm -hmm. You know, we, are, we have a, um, hand sanitizers at the end cap of every aisle in the grocery store. God forbid we should be exposed to germs. Our children are not allowed to play in the dirt, and our environments are very, very sterile. And as mentioned, we are grossly overusing antibiotics. 75% uh, in America of the antibiotics that we are using actually go into livestock and then become another part of our, our food chain. Uh, so, uh, interestingly, as Dr. Martin Blazer has written in the book, uh, Missing Microbes, uh, he believes that this incredible exposure to antibiotics that we have and the changes that have occurred in our gut bacteria because of our misplaced faith in antibiotics may be related to our obesity epidemic. You know, the reason, one of the reasons that antibiotics are given to cattle is because it immediately fattens them up. That was discovered in the uh, early 1950s. So that's why we continue to use uh, antibiotics in, in animal husbandry because, or in, in growing uh, uh, these animals because it makes them fat, makes them more valuable. Uh, but we're now seeing, you know, governmental uh, involvement in that with the hopes of reducing that or, or hopefully uh, eliminating antibiotic exposure in that regard. But, you know, keep in mind that uh, you go to the walk-in clinic with the sniffles or a cough, and if you don't walk out with a prescription for an antibiotic, you're going to ask yourself, what did I just do? Why did I waste my time? Mm -hmm. They didn't give me an antibiotic, a bacterial antibiotic for a viral illness. And I tell my patients two things. That's like having your gallbladder removed if you have appendicitis, so it makes no sense. And also I say, you know, if you have a cold and you go to the uh, doctor for an antibiotic and get an antibiotic, your cold is only going to last a week. But if you don't take the antibiotic, it's going to last seven days. And, you know, usually takes them a few moments to process that. <laughs> That's a joke, Mark. <laughs> Stay with me on this. Uh, you know, but the point is it makes no sense to take an antibiotic when you have a cold. Uh, we now see literature in very well-respected, peer-reviewed journals that indicates that the idea of, for example, taking an antibiotic when you go to the dentist to have your teeth cleaned because you have an artificial hip or you have an artificial knee doesn't make any sense. That the risk of infecting that prosthesis is not increased if you don't take an antibiotic. So, you know, people are finally coming to the realization that this uh, very um, um, over the profound overusage of antibiotics is clearly uh, having a potential, uh, a serious downside not just in changing the microbiome, but also in creating uh, antibiotic-resistant organisms, which I'm sure all of the viewers of this podcast will realize is becoming a very real issue indeed. People now know the term MRSA. I mean, everybody has heard of MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph uh, infection, staph, uh, uh, which makes uh, treating these infections very, very uh, challenging. We never had that growing up. We didn't have infections for which we had no antibiotics. That prediction has come home to roost. And, you know, to get back to the original part of our discussion, we got to welcome dirt back into our lives. We've got to be dirty. <laughs> Let our kids play in the dirt. Uh, and don't be so overly concerned with uh, sanitization of everything. And, you know, I might just take a step back and, and talk about for a moment where we get the microbiome. Mm -hmm. How do we get these bugs uh, first as we enter the world uh, into our intestines, into our mouths, uh, into, onto our skin? And we get them uh, through a very profound mechanism. It's called birth. And when we are born, we pass through mother's birth canal. And the bacteria that live in the birth canal are absolutely perfectly uh, ready to inoculate the newborn with a, a microbiome that will allow him or her to respond to his environment, to be able to process the lactose sugar in mother's milk, to be able to respond to those immunoglobulins that are presented in human breast milk, 
to be able to respond to the bacteria that are on the skin of the mother, in the, on the breast, to again further develop that microbiome. Now, when a child is born by C-section, cesarean section, and let me say that this is not mommy bashing, that this, this discussion that we'll have now is really uh, to first be prefaced by the, the idea that C-sections save lives. They're fundamentally a wonderful procedure to save life of mother and or newborn or infant being born. But that said, the, the idea that a third of all births in America have to be created by C-section uh, is certainly uh, an interesting statistic. That would mean that a third of all births are, or a third of all pregnancies are complicated and require a C-section. We know that not to be true. Uh, with all due respect, some C-sections are performed out of a matter of convenience. When a child is born by C-section, he does not pass through the birth canal and is therefore deprived of that perfect array of bacteria that so fosters the creation of a highly functional microbiome, a highly functional array of bacteria in his or her gut. And because the gut bacteria play such a fundamental role in immune function, being born by C-section is associated with a, a significant increase in uh, immune and inflammatory um, issues. For example, being born by C-section is associated with an 80% increased risk for developing celiac disease. It's associated with a threefold increase in developing ADHD. It's associated with a doubling of the risk of, of, of having a child with autism. It's associated with a 70% increased risk of type 1 diabetes. So these are illnesses uh, which are serious and uh, which are predicated on immune dysregulation and inflammation. And again, I, I, I want to be so clear that C-sections are an important tool that we have to save lives. But I'm making these correlations because I think it's very important to strengthen this understanding of the role of the microbiome and the creation of that microbiome in terms of immunity and inflammation and how that may have, have effects later in life. The 50% increased risk of obesity being born by C-section, that's something that occurs later in life. And there's a direct correlation between obesity and risk for Alzheimer's. So this becomes a very germane discussion as it relates to the notion of preventive medicine uh, with reference to brain health. And I think that's very important. So really what's happened is we've opened up this door called brain health. It leads us in part into the gut, um, which leads us in part into the birthing process, for goodness sakes. It's, there's such a return here to, I think, just some of the primal aspects of being a human being alive on planet Earth. You know, you talked about letting your kids play in the dirt, for goodness sakes. Um, there's something about our nature, it seems, that we've lost a little bit that, you know, as per your discussion, we're starting to circle back now because clinical experience tells us so, because science tells us so. I think that's amazing. <laughs> well, look, we've been here for, for um, two million years, mm -hmm. so it works. Yeah. The whole thing works, but it's you know, we can talk about the paleo diet, and I think the paleo diet is an idea that is really very important, that we uh, look at the idea of eating foods that to some degree emulate what our forebears consumed because it worked for them. But it's well beyond that. Uh, it's understanding that we are a, uh, you know, a modern day organism uh, functioning uh, on a paleolithic uh, set of instructions. And to look at the birthing process, for example, as a way of uh, affecting the, the newborn from well beyond the fact that he or she inherited mom and dad's genes, but in, more importantly, affect um, how that individual is programmed with respect to the microbiome being born through the birth canals, I think uh, fundamental that here is the transfer of 99% of uh, genetic material, far more than mom and dad's uh, gametes uh, coming together to form th this perfect union. 
Now, this is what we call vertical transfer of genetic information, this process of giving uh, the child at birth his or her final set of walking orders. The last minute, most up-to-date information about what that child should expect from an environmental perspective is transmitted at the moment of birth mm -hmm. by passing through the birth canal. Now, those bacteria, those, uh, the array of bacteria in the birth canal change during the course of the year. If a child's born at one time of the year, it's going to look different than born at another time of year. If a child is born to a mother who is uh, not uh, ha in a, living in an environment where she doesn't have adequate nutritional status, that will be reflected in the change of bacteria that changes in such a way to make that child more adaptable to this environment where food sources may not be readily available. It's really, it's a breathtakingly beautiful paradigm. But, you know, it's not limited to mammals who have, who deliver their children through birth canal, uh, the birth canal. Uh, we see it in birds. We see it in reptiles. It is seen in uh, mollusks or clams, oysters, shellfish. Uh, it is uh, seen even in sponges. The transfer, this vertical transfer of material, of genetic bacterial information at the time of birth this goes back hundreds of millions of years as a very fundamental mechanism of informing the newborn and giving that newborn the best chance at survival, which is what transferring genetic material is really all about. So the paleo diet is one aspect of honoring our heritage in terms of treating human physiology in a way that it has evolved over millions of years to be in in complete harmony with the environment. It's, it's a very deep, but on the upside, it's a very empowering discussion. Because when we recognize that there are ways to reestablish gut health by taking probiotics, by uh, consuming prebiotic foods, probiotic foods that I mentioned, uh, and by limiting our exposure to damaging things uh, that change the, the gut bacteria, it, it, this is health at, a, at an all-new level. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to take a step back and, and understand that there are many environmental issues these days that are very relevant uh, in terms of this discussion. For example, the discussion of genetically modified foods, the role of GMO uh, in terms of changing the human microbiome is only just being explored at a time when the genie is very much out of the bottle when just recently genetically modified apples have now been approved. Down here in Florida, uh, they are about to release genetically modified mosquitoes in the Everglades so that mosquitoes don't replicate. They're an important part of the food chain. But I think also more importantly is the fact that here in America, most of the GMO uh, mentality has been geared at creating uh, what is called Roundup resistant crops. Crops that are created so that we can use, uh, I, I don't want to say we, I don't want to be included in that group, so that glyphosate or Roundup can be sprayed on our food and it'll kill the weeds but won't kill the crops, won't kill the corn and it won't kill the soy. And the problem with that mentality is beyond the fact that the corn and the soy have been genetically modified, there are residues of glyphosate or Roundup in the food chain to a significant degree. And we know that glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is in fact a significant modifier of the human microbiome. Now the role of that in terms of a long-term health consequence is not being explored to any significant degree. This represents a clear and present danger that we really need to have discussions about. Uh, you know, glyphosate uh, affects mitochondrial function, it affects mm -hmm. cytochrome P450 detoxification, it affects the way that we metabolize uh, what are called aromatic amino acids, which are the precursors to our neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine. I mentioned serotonin before in terms of its role in depression. So, uh, you know, <laughs> we're covering a lot of area today, but but that said, I think these are fundamentally critical issues that, um, that I am discussing with you today because your audience uh, is the audience, I think, that can uh, implement changes 
and vote with their wallets saying, yes, I want to buy food that bears the label non-GMO. We want to vote with our wallets so more and more food purveyors and manufacturers of products will recognize the value of sourcing ingredients that are not genetically modified. You know, David, I want to make a big picture comment, and I'm going to state the obvious, but what, what, what fascinates me about this conversation is here we are, we've ended up talking about these, these tiny, you can't see them with your naked eye organisms, and they are really leading us into a conversation about what is health, what's good nutrition, how should we birth our children, and what's going on and on and on and on and on? What's going on in the food realm? What's going on with food companies? What's what's going on with the environment? It's it feels as if the conversation of nutrition can no longer be limited to, hey, what's good for me to eat? Uh, what should? Yeah, of, of course, we want to know that information. But wow, is everything connected here? And we have to look at our entire world uh, and how we do business to really understand what's happening in my body. Well, Chief Seattle said that man did not weave the web of life. He is only a strand in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, this takes us to this understanding of our, our vast interconnectedness, not just with other people on this planet, but to the entire uh, biosphere, the entire global biome. And, uh, you know, the health of your body is dependent upon the health of the multitude of organisms that live within you. And when you take that to the macro level, the health, the health of uh, Gaia, the health of our planet, uh, is certainly dependent upon the health of all of us as people representing the Earth's microbiome. So, you know, there, you take this to multiple levels, and um, I, I think that we're not going to legislate these changes uh, because we're up against, um, you know, powerful organizations that want to continue to manufacture these products. But I think, uh, from a consumer perspective, that when we see going from 2007 uh, to 2014, uh, the number of Americans in a survey who indicated that they uh, have done their very best or at least try to avoid GMO uh, has gone from 15% to 40%. You know, voting with your wallet is very, very powerful because yeah. that changes what people then supply to us uh, to purchase. So, you know, my, my call uh, to the viewers is choose GMO, choose organic as much as you possibly can because then in that small way you're voting for the purveyors of these products to make those products more available to you and you know hopefully there will come a day when most of the food available uh, to us is organic and uh... yeah you know you mentioned a moment ago that uh... it's beyond just the food that we eat but i would submit that in terms of the health of the microbiome that our food choices are probably uh, the most powerful uh, influence that we can wield in terms of healing the microbiome, in terms of increasing the diversity of gut bacteria. And when you eat foods that are organic, are organic especially those that have come right out of the ground, uh, your ability to, to inoculate your gut with a more uh, robust variety of, of organisms, I think, is enhanced. Mm -hmm. So help me understand how you made the leap from Grain Brain to Brain Maker. First, tell me when Brain Maker comes out. Brain Maker is coming out August 28th of this year, 2015. Okay, so this is airing uh, at the end of June, so shortly thereafter, Brain Maker comes out. So tell me some of the reasons, and I know we've been talking about it, perhaps a why else you're excited about this book. Well, I am... I, I guess you can see I'm very excited about it. So by the time this airs, BrainMaker is already out. So your viewers will know uh, what's going on with BrainMaker. And uh, I think if you want to um, see the nuts and bolts about what is going on with this book, just go to YouTube. There's a trailer, BrainMaker trailer. Just put that on YouTube and you can see a really cool video clip about what the book is all about. Uh, I, I'm not trying to uh, aggrandize this situation, but I think... Um, this is representing a paradigm shift 
in our our total understanding of human health. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been uh, inoculated, <laughs> inculcated with the notion of germs being the enemy of every germ, every bacteria is a pathogen and we've got to be germ free. Oh my gosh, uh, my, t my child just touched the ground, uh, I'm going to wash his hands quickly and um, that's the worst thing that we can do. We've got to welcome back to the table the notion that germs are our friends, that they are fundamentally important for our health. And when we see globally uh, the research going on in the human microbiome, uh, that in America hundreds of millions of dollars are now dedicated to the human microbiome project, scientists are getting it. And I think, you know, my mission in BrainMaker was to really do what Grain Brain did, and that is to really put it in your face that uh, we've got to understand what our scientists are exploring. In Brain Maker, it's where we are with this powerful role of the gut bacteria uh, in every aspect of human physiology and therefore in terms of every aspect of human health and disease. Uh, with Grain Brain, we were all over the notion of uh, that welcoming back to the table dietary fat is a good thing and restricting our carbohydrates is very very important and at the time of this recording today you'll note that it was just last week that an advisory uh, dietary uh, co committee uh, uh, told the uh, government committee uh, told us that we've got to do exactly that we've got to start welcoming back to the table foods higher in fat that carbohydrates are the killers, that there is no relationship between dietary cholesterol and risk for coronary artery disease or any other disease for that matter, and that earlier this year, in April of this year, of last year, 2014, how welcome it was that the Annals of Internal Medicine published a report indicating in their study of over 500,000 uh, individuals that consumption of uh, higher levels of the dreaded saturated fat conferred no risk, no added risk for a coronary artery disease. And yet, all these years we've been told, oh, you've got to eat low fat and don't eat uh, this because it contains saturated fat. We've got to understand that it's time to stop scientizing our foods and recognize that the best foods that we should eat are the foods that we've always eaten. And I'm not mean, concerned about the past few uh, decades when scientists told us low fat, uh, use artificial sweeteners, and by all means don't, uh, don't worry about eating carbs. That is a complete aberration that hopefully we can put to rest and recognize it was a period of our uh, naivete that we told, we told people that, that uh, paleo type foods uh, are important, that really what we've got to pretty much fill our plates with and this is an area that, you know, people say, gee, you know, what you're talking about eating meat and all these things uh, is in such uh, contradistinction to things uh, like are discussed in the China study uh, and that the people who are uh, vegetarian are talking about. Not really. Most of the plate needs to be filled with fiber-rich, nutrient-dense, generally above-ground vegetables that are colorful and that you can welcome back to your plate uh, meat, uh, eggs, fish, etc. But we've got to be careful how these are sourced. Meat should be grass-fed, not grain-fed. You know, uh, there's been a, a statement that, oh, it takes 14 or 16 pounds of grain uh, to make a, a pound of beef. Well, that whole notion is, in my opinion, uh, not very appropriate uh, because cows shouldn't eat grain, never have eaten grain, nor has their predecessor, the Auroch, which is where cows came from, they ate grass. So when you return those animals to their paleo diet, which was grass, then you create a healthful food, a food that's much higher uh, in the omega-3s, inflammation-reducing omega-3s, that reduces the omega-6s, that caters to the human microbiome. So again, I mean, we've talked about this. This is getting people back to, getting them back to the garden, like Joni Mitchell wrote when she wrote the song Woodstock. Mm -hmm. We've got to get ourselves back to the garden. We've got to get ourselves back to the original lifestyle environment that created us, that made us who we are. Now, that can be the Garden of Eden, uh, whatever garden you want to, to think about. 
But the point is, we've got to understand that every bit of our discussion today has centered upon the science of what is called epigenetics. The idea that the human genome is nothing fixed, it's nothing static, but that it is highly responsive and expressive in terms of its signaling from the environment. And the most powerful signaling to our genome to change its expression, to upregulate certain genes to protect us at certain times, has to do with both the food that we consume and the role, therefore, played upon our food on the microbiome and how the bacteria in our guts change in terms of their gene expression. And even more heady is the notion that the bacterial uh, expression in, in the gut affects our own DNA that changes in the complexion of the gut bacteria affect the expression of our own DNA. Those 23,000 uh, genes that we carry, they're altered in their expression by the ratios of healthy to dysbiotic bacteria that are contained within our gut. And that is affected by our food choices as well. So, wow, there are a lot of entrance points into, into this discussion, aren't there? It's a brave new world, and it makes me think, you know, here we are, we, we started out talking about brain health, and it takes a very, I want to say, flexible mind to embrace many of the concepts that you're introducing, um, and indeed, having a flexible mind will help us have a better brain and a better mind and all that sort of thing, so I'm, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm really taken at what our opportunity is here, really. Yeah. Um, so that's I, the empowering part. Yeah. You know, it, it's wonderful uh, to embrace this information and and look at the various uh, vectors that are coming in to alter our health based upon changes in the microbiome. But I see the glass as as much more full than even halfway because you said it very well. Uh, this offers us up great opportunities to intervene based upon our new understanding of this science and these new very powerful leverage points that are just beginning to be defined uh, and giving us incredible opportunity to uh, not only reverse disease but to keep people healthy in the long run. So if you could wave your magic wand and uh, have a bunch of wishes fulfilled for the next uh, couple of decades in terms of where this is all going to go, what would you like to see happen? I think that um, I'd like to see mainstream, well-funded pharmaceutical endeavors uh, to get involved with this, and I, I think that's going to happen. Um, I'd like to see, as mentioned, a, um, a, a bigger uh, understanding uh, on the part of the general population in terms of the role of, them, of the gut bacteria in health and how influences like food choices play. Uh, and perversions of our food choices like GMO and glyphosate are affecting the microbiome. But I would say uh, I can foresee a time, maybe a decade, maybe two decades from now, when there will be specific interventions geared at restoring uh, the uh, gut, uh, the microbiome, uh, in terms of being actually disease-specific. Uh, in, order, in other words, treating specific disease by offering up specific species of organisms to be implanted in the gut to specifically target a disease. But beyond that, I think we're going to come to a time when preemptively people will undergo 16S RNA sequencing or characteri characterizing their gut microbiome. In fact, there are companies right now that offer that up. Uh, there's a company called Ubiome that's out there that can actually allow you to look at uh, the bacterial array that you have, which I think is great, but the question is that I have is, well, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. We don't know what to do with that yet. Uh, but what I'm hoping is, in the near to midterm, uh, that we then can look at that information and then say, okay, here's what we found, and here is what would be more ideal for that individual, and here is how we can correct it. But here's what we can do today. Again, we can implement the, the knowledge base uh, that we traumatize our microbiome with chlorinated water, uh, with exposure to toxins, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, over usage, non-judicious usage of antibiotics, 
both directly and also in our, uh, our food chain. Uh, that we've got to emphasize whenever possible vaginal delivery as opposed to cesarean section. Uh, that, again, we shouldn't be treating our children with antibiotics every time they have an ear infection or a cold, recognizing that each of these events alters the microbiome. This is a big call for breastfeeding. That's an important player in the developing microbiome. And finally, understanding that we can uh, augment and enhance uh, the diversity of organisms in the gut uh, by our food choices, by choosing foods that are rich in probiotics, fermented foods, uh, as well as prebiotics uh, that I've already listed. So there's good news here. There's great news. This is, is a new dawn. It's, um, this is as big a news as the discovery, you know, the creation of the so-called germ theory, mm -hmm. the antibiotics that followed that, which saved countless lives. My own father, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, knocking antibiotics. I think they've been a powerful tool. When I was a kid, my dad had bacterial endocarditis. Had it not been for intravenous antibiotics, you know, we, it's quite clear what would have happened to him. Uh, and so, you know, there are countless stories. So antibiotics have a place, a very valuable place. But it's certainly quite clear that uh, they've been and continue to be ag aggressively misused, and we're paying the price for that. So here we are in a brave new world, amazing opportunities, and it, and it feels like this body of research is just exploding. Like Absolutely. it's exploding now. So why don't you give us a sense of how we can stay on top of this, stay in touch with you and your world and other resources uh, that you can recommend from what you're doing. Sure. Fill us in. I have a website, drperlmutter.com. That's drperlmutter.com. And I blog uh, almost every day. And generally, the nature of my blogs is uh, I pull a peer-reviewed study, I attach it to the blog, and then I explain it so everybody can understand why it's important. Uh, for example, uh, a recent blog demonstrating uh, the role of uh, inflammation in uh, depression. Who knew? Who knew that there are, uh, there are higher markers of gut permeability found in depression than uh, individuals who aren't depressed? So I link to an article peer-reviewed. I explain it. So follow me closely there. I do a video post uh, every week. Uh, and hopefully by the time this interview airs, I will have a weekly podcast that will be live probably on, uh, on a platform that allows people to interact with me in real time. Um, I have another PBS program that will be uh, uh, airing in September of 2015. So I'm doing my best to get this information out. And uh, it is exploding, uh, no question. Uh, this information is exploding around the globe because people finally are recognizing the, the potent uh, leverage points that are offered by embracing this information. And we're at the very primordial stage uh, of our understanding of this. And, you know, you asked me 10 years, 20 years, I, I, I can only wait uh, to see what we'll be doing at, at, at that time because I think this is a brave new world in a very, very positive way. And it's probably, um, you know, what we've been waiting for. It's, it's the, absolutely the paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Dr. Perlmutter, thank you for continuing to be a cheerleader, an innovator, uh, somebody out there at the front lines really, really digging this stuff out from the research and translating it and making it uh, understandable for a general population. Because again, what you're saying, it is profound. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about it because, you know, <laughs> as you've said, you know, you've you gave, you know, a couple of powerful examples of how this can really work in a real in a real life way, in a clinical way. So we've got some powerful tools to use. Thank you so much. Mark, thank you for the opportunity. And I want to commend you for what you do. Um, you know, getting information out like this is helping a lot of people and you know, you're helping push the ball down the field, and I, I sure want you to know how much I appreciate that. Thanks so, thanks so much, my friends. That's what we do. Thank you, David. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in.